Holy and loving God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be together, uh, to learn, to grow, and we pray that your spirit would just fall fresh on us. We pray that you will nudge our hearts, that we might be surprised by joy, that we might have a sense of wonder, uh, a, a deeper sense of the incredible love that you have for us. So many ministries, uh, but they all point to this great love. And so we just thank you for the opportunity to be here and pray your blessing upon it and upon Dr. Brown. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn it over to Linda, and she's going to introduce Dr. Brown. Welcome, everybody. Um, so before I introduce Dr. Brown, I'd like to recognize Dave Meekoff. Um, so for 20 years now, we have hosted the Meekoff Lectures, um, of course, in loving memory of Doreen. And each year we have the honor of participating in these amazing lectures. Um, we've seen a wide range of topics over the years, everything from faith, social witness, and various worship topics. So thank you, Dave. Just a reminder that we do have coffee and cookies following the lecture tonight, and then tomorrow's morning's lecture is preceded by coffee and muffins at 9 a.m. Um, just show of hands, who all is planning on coming? Excellent. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great. And then, of course, Sunday, Dr. Brown will preach at both worship services and present the adult CE. So um, before I welcome um, Dr. Brown, let me share a little bit about him. He's an ordained Presbyterian minister and a professor of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary in Georgia. Um, a well-published author and a founding member of Earth Covenant Ministry, which I know is dear to many of our hearts. Um, recently was a member of the Center of Theological Inquiry at Princeton, where he collaborated we worked with scientists, philosophers, ethicists, exploring the societal implications of astrobiology. And I'm just thinking that that would have been very cool to be the fly on the wall in that conversation. Um, so over the next few days, we're going to have the honor of hearing more about the common ground of wonder in God's word and world. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brown. So, thank you for inviting me. It is an honor to be part of this wonderful lectureship established by Dave Beekoff. Uh, and so it's been 20 years now, and I had a chance to review the list of some of the previous speakers over the years, and I must say that you lowered the bar in order to get them. So, uh, we'll see, we'll see. But I'm honored and delighted to be here at Newport Presbyterian Church. Uh, I was here um, a couple of years ago at Covenant Shores, um, where um, Rita Liu was responsible for inviting me to present some lectures uh, to that community, and I enjoyed that so much that I prayed that I would be able to come back sometime. And lo and behold, by answering prayer, God has brought me back, and I'm very thankful for that. I look forward to getting to know you uh, tonight and into tomorrow and into Sunday as well as we uh, travel together this weekend on this common ground of wonder uh, between of God's word and world. And so I teach Old Testament, and I've been doing it for um, almost 29 years now, oh first at uh, Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, now called Union Presbyterian Seminary, otherwise known as UPS. Um, yeah, you get it. So, uh, and now Columbia Theological Sem Seminary, uh, CTS. Uh, and uh, I tell you, every time I teach students, um, I always learn something new about the Bible. Um, and I've realized that the way it works when it comes to studying the Bible is that it has to be done together. And so, I, I, I'd like to market a bumper sticker 
um, like some of those old bumper stickers that were popular in the 90s that identified certain professions or denominations and said something clever about them, like um, astronomers do it in the dark. <laughs> uh, Baptists do it underwater. <laughs> and Presbyterians do it by <laughs> committee. <laughs> or ceasingly and in order. But yeah. yeah. uh, well, my bumper sticker would be, and, and this requires maybe a little explanation. <clears throat> um, have you ever heard the term exegesis? Yeah. yeah, that means basically biblical study using the original languages as such. Um, Laura, you know something about exegesis, of course. Any seminary, seminarian or anybody who's graduated from seminary has to go through various exegetical courses. So my bumper sticker would be exegetes do it in public. <laughs> that is to say that biblical study can only go so far when you're doing it alone with the Bible and with commentaries and the like. But rather, it's something that you do in community. And what I've learned over the years is that um, I learn new things about the Bible when I'm in dialogue with others who see and read Scripture through different lenses, through different eyes. And so some of my most um, profound insights have come in, in the classroom, in conversation, in the dialogue. And so I hope that we will have a chance to be in dialogue together um, uh, tonight and tomorrow. Um, I probably won't ask for much dialogue when I'm preaching, uh, so I'm just telling you that. Um, but, uh, but if you do have something to say in the middle of my sermon, feel free to do that. I mean, so dialogue is how it happens. And so I look forward to our conversations uh, starting tonight. So I've been asked to do something on um, uh, Genesis and science. There we go. Uh, or the creation accounts uh, in conversation with science. And so the cat was, out, was left out of the bag uh, when Linda said that I spent a whole year studying astrobiology at the Center of Theological Inquiry in Princeton, New Jersey. And so for whatever reason, they asked the Bible person to come and be a part of the conversation with scientists and ethicists, philosophers, and theologians. So I was the only one representing the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Uh, but I learned so much, and, uh, and it gave me a new lens through which to interpret my faith uh, in God's vast creation of the cosmos, in fact. And so you're going to hear a little astrobiology, I think. Uh, maybe not so much tonight, but more so tomorrow. Um, so that's a plug for tomorrow. If you don't know what astrobiology is, it's simply um, exploring the possibility of life beyond planet Earth. So I'll leave it at that. And, um, but if you talk to a NASA scientist, she'll say invariably that within the next 10 to 15 years, we'll be discovering life beyond Earth. Um, so I'll say more about that tomorrow. Anyway, what does that have to do with creation, creation <coughs> theology? Well, I think it may have a lot to do with expanding our image of God as the creator of the universe, uh, the possibility that there may be life beyond this planet. Uh, as well. Does that mean then there are more than one Genesis? There's more than one Genesis uh, going on? Maybe so. But anyway, we're going to talk about Genesis 1 in conversation with science. But before we do that, I want to um, share with you sort of how I see myself as a biblical scholar interpreting scripture for today. So I'm going to show you some images that I think illustrate how we were all to situate ourselves in Bible study in the world in which we live.
Did that music sound familiar? <laughs> it's been overplayed, I understand that. I presented that to a, um, actually, Myrtle Beach Presbyterian Church uh, several years ago. And right after this, one person raised his hand and said, oh, 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 I know what that music is. And then without even me giving him permission to speak, he said, that's Ozo Sprach Zarazustra by Richard Strauss. And before I could say, you show off you, uh, somebody else raised up his hand and said, no, 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 no. That's the fight song for the University of South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned something new that, that time. Uh, but I apologize for playing this well-used, uh, overplayed music. But in any case, um, I think the challenge of biblical interpretation today is to put one foot within the text and keep one foot in the context in which we live. And we all come from different contexts. We all have had our different upbringings, our families of origin, um, our cultural experiences, um, our diversity of culture. These are all lenses that shape the way we read scripture. And it's always good to have a different pair of eyes reading scripture from oneself to share that together. And sometimes the best insights and understandings and wisdom come from that sharing of the different ways scripture can be read in different contexts. But for this tonight, I want to talk about the context of science and the context of scripture. That is to say, if we back up on these, these images earlier, so you have the context of scripture, its ancient context, uh, ancient Israel and the early church. Uh, and then on the other hand, there's the context of, of what we know about creation, about the world, about nature through the lens of science. Um, and, and, uh, and to bring these worlds together in conversation. Now that's really nothing new, uh, because way back, even John Chrysostom, uh, an early church father, um, and uh, others, all the way up to Augustine and even Calvin, uh, talk about that God actually wrote two books. One was the Bible, the other book is creation. Mm -hmm. So there's the book of creation and the book of the Bible, and God is the author of both. And so that means that we should read both together because God is the author of both, the same author. Now, if that sounds radical to you, um, I have a psalm to share with you, Psalm 19, that begins, the heavens are declaring the glory of God and the firmament God's handiwork. So even in this most ancient of psalms, there is a recognition that God is speaking. God's glory is manifest in creation, cosmically, and in the land and the waters and the seas. Just later in Psalm 19, that then talks about the Torah of the Lord is perfect. So that psalm, Psalm 19, has creation speaking God's glory, and you have God's Torah, instruction, word, also speaking the wisdom of God. And so it's the psalm that brings them together. So why not do that as we read scripture together, to, to read it together with the... Uh, uh, the uh, the world of creation, authored by God as well. And so we're going to do a little bit of that tonight with Genesis 1. And so with that, yeah, um, Frederick, Frank Hoyle, a uh, British astronomer, once said that if there is ever a photograph taken of Earth in outer space, that it would revolutionary, revolutionize the way we live on our planet. So I think it's 1974 or so, Apollo, it's Apollo 11, uh, that we had the, uh, uh, perhaps the first photograph um, of Earth as it was uh, flying to the moon. And so this particular iconic photograph, the blue marble is sometimes referred to, um, says it all, this is our home. Uh, this is our planet, and uh, it has changed, I think, the way some of us live on this planet as well. Uh, it's full of color, 
uh, and yet it's set against this sort of expanse of space, which makes this planet look pretty small. Um, has the planet been changing at all as a result of our living on this planet? To be sure, it has. And so the picture of Earth at night lit up by uh, urban centers throughout the world uh, as well. This is our imprint upon the planet. So if any alien were simply swinging by the, our solar system neighborhood and they saw planet Earth, they would easily recognize, immediately recognize that this, this planet not only hosts life, but intelligent life as well. Uh, so yeah, we are changing the face of the planet. Um, particularly in this generation, and of course for generations to come as well. So how do we read scripture knowing that we are the most powerful species on this planet, and that we are changing the face of this, of this common home? Um, how, do, how do we understand the ancient scriptures in light of this context? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> but if we, uh, if we go back to science, yeah, there it is. We know from science a lot more about the universe uh, within the last, say, 50 years than, um, than the past thousands upon thousands of years that uh, humanity has been observing the heavens. And so what we know now is so revolutionary compared to what we used to know. And that began with Edwin Hubble back in the, well, back in the 19. Uh, 20, so almost, yeah, almost 100 years, I guess, yes, indeed, in which he discovered that galaxies existed beyond the Milky Way. And he also observed that these galaxies were rushing away from each other. That is, we live in an accelerating universe. There's never going to be a big crunch when the universe collapses upon itself, which was an, an idea entertained by astronomers of an earlier generation. But we know now, through the uh, increasing force of dark energy, that, uh, that galaxies are flying apart from each other, that the universe is expanding. And it's expanding at an accelerating rate. Uh, so, and it all began, of course, back in the so-called Big Bang, 13.81 billion years ago. So our universe is pretty, pretty old and is continually, continuing to evolve and change, uh, accelerate. Um, and so uh, it's right at that point when uh, time is measured in, in the smallest fractions of a second in which this explosion of energy occurred, um, marking the beginning of both space and time. And after hundreds of thousands of years, that energy began to cool, and then matter began to form, uh, quarks, subatomic particles, then atoms, then molecules, and the like, and our first stars appearing, yeah, about a half a billion years um, uh, after the Big Bang. Um, so that explosion is referred to technically as an inflation, but it has nothing to do with the economics. It's an inflation that happens uh, in the twinkling of an eye, in which everything, everything, space itself expands uh, at a hyper rate. Um, and then with that, then things begin to cool and matter begins to be formed. Um, and so the first stars, evolution of the galaxies, um, and, um, and then you have these interesting objects after 13, here it says 13, um, yeah, 13 billion, 700 million years uh, from then. Uh, but we have these objects introduced into space. These are our um, satellites and uh, rockets and the space station, the International Space Station is also there, all part of the Earth complex of life. And so, yeah, humanity, Homo sapiens, um, uh, emerging, um, 200,000 years ago, but we weren't the only species, but now we're the only human species, and uh, we are certainly making a technological imprint upon our planet, and in space as well, as, as you know. All part of the cosmic evolution that goes back to Big Bang 
when the universe began as a sort of subatomic uh, uh, field of energy. Okay. And here are some, some of the phenomena of cosmic evolution, uh, time-wise, chronologically-wise, uh, formation of atoms, the onset of darkness. First stars, 400 to 600 million years uh, in after the Big Bang. Our sun is uh, 5 billion years ago. Um, Earth, uh, 4.5 billion years ago, beginning of life, 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago. And then the evolution of life, uh, beginning with photosynthesis, uh, more complex multicellular organisms, the first fish, plants, land animals, dinosaurs, the extinctions of the dinosaur, and then Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago. So that's a whirlwind tour of, of evolution from the Big Bang, the evolution of life, and, and now the most complex creature on this planet, Homo sapiens. So with that in mind, what do we do when we come to Genesis 1? First thing we say is that Genesis 1 is not a scientific text. Uh, it has a different way of looking at the universe, very different from what we know of the universe to be today. Um, sometimes referred to as the three-tiered universe or the Astrodome model, but uh, according to um, the ancient conception of creation, you had the great deep down below, you have land in the middle, and then you have the firmament holding the waters above um, here as a vault or a dome. And then God above the waters, the celestial waters. And so this is the ancient conception of creation. And that's the conception out of which Genesis 1 uh, was written. So let's jump into Genesis 1, knowing that Genesis 1 is not going to shed any new light that we could call scientific. On the other hand, there are some profound things that Genesis 1 has to say about what it means to live in God's creation. So, in the beginning, Genesis 1, 1. So, this is perhaps the translation you're most familiar with, the King James Version. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you have the New Revised Standard Version, that would read, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth. That's the NRSV. And there's another translation out there that actually translates the first verse as when God began to create the heavens and the earth. And that's the, uh, that's the NVV version. You know that version, right? It's the new brown version. <laughs> but it's not unique. It's actually the, uh, also the Jewish Publication Society version. Uh, as well. And I'm here to tell you actually that, um, that that third translation is more consonant with the Hebrew than the other two translations. But for English teachers and grammarians among us, what grammatically is different between the King James Version and whether it's the NRSV or the NBV version? Uh, what's, what's different grammatically with this first, uh, first clause? It's continuing creation. Pardon? Well, you began to create, so there's a continuing creation. Yeah, so grammatically, what is that, how is that reflected in this verse? Exactly. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, this is a complete sentence. These two translations are not complete sentences. Uh, they move on into the next verse. So, particularly this one, this would be a temporal clause that is there to preface what comes next in verse 2. What comes next in verse 2? And the earth was vacuum and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, while the breath of God was hovering over the water's surface. Uh, that's the complete sentence, then. That's the main clause. And then what follows that, then God said, let there be light. There was light. Kaboom. Call it the big flash. Yeah. So this is not the translation of the King James or the NRSV. Um, uh, in the King James, it would be 
while the Spirit of God, uh, I forget what the verb is uh, in the King James, the Spirit of God was some, doing something over the surface of the waters. Was it hovering? Yeah. Anybody have a King James version? Yeah. Well, the NRSV, I do remember that one, translates that, and the wind of God was sweeping over the face of the waters. Yeah. So my translation is, and God's breath was hovering over the water's surface. The Hebrew word is ruach. Repeat after me. Ruach. Ruach. Yeah. Ruach, Hebrew for well, it's the same word, whether it be spirit, wind, or breath. Um, I think it's breath. And here is how I'm going to demonstrate it. Uh, if you're able, I ask you to please stand up. If you can. All right, all right. And what I want you to do is breathe deeply. Um, just breathe in. Hold it. And breathe out. Again, breathe in. Breathe out. Okay. Return to normal breath. What I'm going to do now is that when I start reading Genesis 1 1, I want you to breathe in and hold your breath. And then you're going to let it out when you hear the word let. All right? All right. I, mean, I won't try to read too slow. <laughs> So here we go. Okay. Breathe in. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a breath from God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. All right, you can sit down. What you have just done, you've experienced something of the divine, according to Genesis 1. Because for me, the picture is, God is like holding God's breath. God's breath is suspended over the water's surface. And then when God speaks, what happens? Light. But what, does, what happens to God's breath? It's exhaled. It's like God breathes life out uh, into the dark waters. That is to say that um, Ruach, I think, refers literally to God's breath. And clearly, this is an anthropomorphic view of God. God has breath. Um, and of course, in Genesis 2, God strolls through the garden in human form. And so uh, our biblical authors liked to anthropomorphize God. Uh, clearly, they saw that as met metaphorical, to be sure. But, uh, but in this case, um, God's breath is active in every step of creation in Genesis 1. Every time God speaks, there's breath that is exhaled. Have you ever tried to speak while inhaling? Can you, is that possible? I'm not going to even try. I don't think it's possible. Uh, but here is this wonderful sort of pre-creative condition of, of you have this sort of amorphous kind of primordial soup of watery mass and darkness, but then there's God's breath, and everything is poised, and God is waiting for the right time to launch creation into being, and it begins with God commanding, God speaking, God exhaling, and so God's breath now is exhaled, it's no longer held by God. And that begins the story of creation. The first act of creation, uh, light, yeah. And so through the lens of science, um, you might think of the Big Bang as uh, involved with this creation of light according to Genesis 1. In fact, um, you know the word Big Bang used widely in astronomy today, in astrophysics? Um, originally it was a pejorative term when um, the theory that the universe actually had a beginning with this sort of inflation of energy. Fred Hoyle, British astronomer, uh, said, oh, let's just call it the Big Bang. Um, and he said that pejoratively because he thought it sounded so biblical. 
and the term stuck. So this is the Big Bang, <laughs> or the Big Flash. And so when I read the ancient scriptures in Genesis, whether in English or in Hebrew, which is what I'm paid to do is translate from Hebrew, um, I can't but help think of the Big Bang, that with this speaking light into being, there is this explosion of space and time uh, as well. It's pretty dramatic. So with that, I want to introduce to you another translation of Genesis 1, 1, 3. And it goes like this. Now when the Almighty was first down with his program, he made the heavens and the earth. The earth there, earth was a fashion misfit being so uncool and dark. But the spirit of the Almighty came down real tough so that he simply said, lighten up. <laughs> and that light was right on time. And then the Almighty liked what he saw and let the light hang out for a while before it was dark again. This comes from the uh, Black Bible Chronicles by P.K. McCary. It came out in 1993. Um, uh, referred to as sort of the uh, uh, kind of street cred African American version of the Pentateuch. But I love this translation. Let there be light, lighten up. God says that to the darkness, lighten up. Which suggests a kind of note of levity to this whole creation process. And whenever I get sort of embroiled in a in a heated theological discussion or a political discussion, and I find um, my pulse rising and I'm getting angry, I have to remember that God's very first words were lighten up. <laughs> that is to say, um, we should enter into these serious conversations with a sense of joy, uh, that we are in the presence of each other in community as we talk certain things out even if we agree to disagree. Still, the conversation should be an exercise of joy and delight because God's first command was to lighten up. So, let's lighten up tonight. Okay, so, I want to share with you some of the things that I find particularly wondrous about Genesis 1. Um, and we're not leaving science aside at this point. We're keeping it sort of bracketed as a potential source of conversation. But I want to enter into the text of Genesis 1 uh, and just kind of linger over the words and their meaning a bit uh, and highlighting certain things that I think are particularly surprising. You know, one thing I've learned in teaching for 29 years, teaching frequently the same texts, is that these ancient texts also have something new to say. That there's always a surprise there uh, to be had, even if you think you've known the text for all this time, even if you think you know Psalm 23 and you've memorized it. There's, there's something surprising about Psalm 23 that most people just don't see. I'll talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> We're in Genesis 1, but remind me, if you want to uh, know something surprising about Psalm 23, I'll share with that share that with you tomorrow. Uh, but to Genesis 1. Um, so, in verse 11, we have God commanding the plants into being, vegetation. But the way God creates is first by command. Every step of creation is, begins with God's command. Let there be light. And in this case, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, so forth and so on. So let me ask this question. Who or what is doing the creating? when it comes to botany. It's the earth. God does not say that there be plants. God says, let the earth bring forth 
plants yielding seed of every kind. That doesn't say the earth is a creative agent mm -hmm. in Genesis. Mm -hmm. So what is God doing? I think God is enlisting the earth, inviting the earth to produce life. What kind of God does that? I think this is a God who likes to collaborate. And in this case, collaborates with the Earth. The Earth is recognized as its own creative agent. It has its own agency. It's almost as if the Earth itself is alive, as it produces life on its surface. First case, plants. And actually, the same can be said about the waters as well. Then God said, in verse 20, let the waters produce swarms of living beings. So now, as the earth generated plants, now the waters are charged to create sea life. But look what happens next in verse 21. So God created the great sea monsters, and every living being that moves, of which the waters produce swarms, according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. So notice that the waters and God are sort of in partnership, they're collaborating together to produce marine life. Um, and then there's those great sea monsters. Reminds me of when a colleague of mine, a Union Presbyterian Seminary, Richmond. So he shared with me one day when um, he said that he had uh, read out loud Genesis 1 to his two young boys who were about five and seven years old. And then when he got to verse 21, then God, so God created the great sea monsters. The young one whispered to the older one, that was a mistake. <laughs> God creating monsters? No way. But look what the text says. And it was good. Even the sea monsters are good. So it looks like that God is collaborating with the waters. Um, and it says that God is the one who created the great sea monsters and everything else. But the waters have a hand in creating these creatures as well. So there's a collaboration. The waters, like the earth, has, the waters have their own creative agency. They're in partnership with God. To be sure, earth and waters were created by God, but now they are agents in their own way, in their own right, when it comes to the creation of life. Same thing back with the land, and let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creepy things wild animals of the earth of every kind. So the land, once again, is enlisted to create animal life on the land, land life. But look how, so that's the, that's the command. Look how it becomes fulfilled. And it was so. And God made wild animals of the earth of every kind. But wait a second. God just charged the earth to create the wild animals. And then it says, God made the wild animals. Hmm. Sort of like with the waters before, with the great sea monsters. Is this a contradiction? What? It has to be, is it either the earth or God? But our author of Genesis 1 says it's both. It's both and, it's not either or. Um, let me put it this way. It's almost as if uh, God was the chair of a committee. And the committee consisted of the earth and the waters. And as the chair of the committee, God set out assignments. All right, earth, you produce plant life. You waters produce marine life. OK, back to you, earth. Give me some land life. And they fulfilled their assignments. But as chair of the committee, God takes the credit. 
which makes God a good Presbyterian. <laughs> this is creation by committee. Yeah. And then there's the creation of humankind. So, notice how God is working collaboratively here as well. Let us make humankind in our image and our likeness, according to our likeness. Yeah. But who's the us? Who's the our? Who's the we behind this command? Christian tradition suggests that it's the Trinity. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Christ, and Holy Ghost, um, that together the Trinity is working to create. Well, that's the Christian interpretation. Of course, Genesis is pre-Christian, um, and so Jewish tradition has a different take on that. Answer. And the rabbis suggested that it is God working with wisdom, God and wisdom together creating humankind. In fact, uh, I think you obviously, who has been to see uh, Michelangelo's depiction of the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel? Yeah, yeah. So you have the two fingers right here. But kind of, there's God with the white beard. Who's that? That's wisdom. Oh, wisdom? Yeah. You had the cupids, the seraphim here, but that, that female figure who is under um, God's left arm is wisdom. So that's, that is actually a Jewish interpretation of, of that verse, chapter 1, verse 26. Let us make humankind in our image. I simply want to suggest that in addition to those um, interpretations, why not bring in the earth and the waters as well? That God is commanding all of these, all of these creative entities to create humankind. That is to say, just like animal life under the sea, on the land, or plant life, um, Genesis 1 is saying that we are the result of a collaborative effort. Um, whether it's the Trinity or wisdom, uh, perhaps also in combination of the earth and the waters. In fact, you know that our bodies are composed of how much, how much of our, what percentage of our bodies is, consists of water? Yeah, I've heard everything from 70 to 90 yeah. percent. Yeah. So uh, our bodies are imprinted by our planet, our, the waters of the planet. Our skin is kind of like the crust of planet Earth. So one could say that we sort of mirror our planet in terms of water and land, blood and skin. Um, and so yeah, the waters and the Earth have a hand in, in the creation of humankind. Um, in the ancient context of Genesis 1, probably what also was uh, envisioned is that God was the head of a divine assembly what we would call angels. Um, and in the Hebrew scriptures, they're referred to as the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim. Uh, you get them in the first two chapters of Job, where God is, uh, is there enthroned among um, the B'nai Elohim, uh, the, literally the children of God, the sons of God, one of whom stands out and engages God in conversation in the book of Job. You know who that is? Hasatan, or the same. I'll have more to say about that tomorrow when we talk about Job. Uh, but there is a full depiction of God and the divine assembly. Um, the angels, if you will, or the messengers of God, or the sons of God. And so is God enlisting the divine assembly in the creation of humanity? Probably that's what was envisioned by our ancient author. Uh, apart from later traditions, Christian and Jewish and otherwise. But it all goes back to God creating by committee, in collaboration. God apparently does not like to work alone. I mean, God can work alone, no doubt about that. Uh, uh, 
when God says that let there be light, um, there's no collaboration there in that first act of creation. Although um, some have suggested, some biblical scholars have suggested that the, the best translation of, um, of that trans of verse 3, let there be light, is let light be unleashed, as if light were already there, but it was hidden in the darkness and had to be unleashed in order to divide the darkness and then divide the day from the night and the light. So, yeah, a lot of interesting questions about what's going on in between the lines of this ancient text. Yeah. So, let us make humankind. Let the waters produce plant life. Uh, let the waters produce marine life. Let the land produce plant life. Let us produce humankind. God likes to work in collaboration. So, with that in mind, I want to show you what I think is most wondrous about Genesis 1. I think it's pretty cool that God likes to work with others and in cooperation, enlisting others, enlisting other creative agents in the production of life. But there's something about the whole pattern of Genesis 1 that I find particularly amazing. So amazing that I call it the Genesis Code. You've heard of the Da Vinci Code, right? Yeah, there's one major difference between the Genesis Code and the Da Vinci Code. Uh, the Genesis Code is true. <laughs> and it has to do with the the code behind the structure of Genesis 1. And so if we kind of make a diagram of how the story of Genesis unfolds, it would go something like this. So on the first day, what's created again? Heaven and earth. Light. Light. That's the first day. Heaven and earth are already there. Or the, kind of an uncreated creation, if you will, is where uh, Genesis 1 begins. But the first formal act of creation is the creation of light. But then there's the second day. So what happens on the second day? That's the third day. So the second day, sort of the in-between day, is when you have this division between the waters above and the waters below. And the waters above are called sky or heaven, Hashemayim. And the waters below are the waters below at this point. And so this firmament, this divider, is what's called a vault or a dome, um, envisioned as a vault or a dome, and called a sky or heaven. Okay, that's day two. So day three is when you actually have the land. And the land emerges from below when the waters are gathered together into discrete bodies. And so the land divides the waters. That is the seas and the oceans. And with that, as you know, is vegetation. And God said, let the earth produce vegetation. So those are the first three days of creation. Then look at the fourth day. There is when you have the stars and the sun and the moon created. That is the lights. And then on the fifth day, that's when you have uh, the birds of the air, or aviary life, winged creatures, including insects, as well as marine life, or sea life. Are you finding a pattern here? Yeah. And then on the sixth day, what gets created on the sixth day? Animals. First, land animals, yes. And then, of course, human beings. There they are. Okay. So there is sort of this symmetry between the first three days of creation and uh, the second set of three days of creation. And so the lights correspond with the life, aviary life with the sky, marine life with the waters, land animals and humans with land and vegetation. It's as if the first three days of creation established the domains, the environments. And then days four, five, and six delineate what populates those domains. And so the domain of light is populated by lights. The greater lights rule the day, the lesser lights to rule the night. 
and the star, the Kokhavim. Um, in fact, it's interesting that uh, uh, the greater light is never named the sun in Genesis 1, nor is the lesser light that rules the night ever named the moon in Genesis 1. They're simply referred to as the greater light and the, the lesser light. Do you know why? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> because to name them, I think from the perspective of the author of Genesis 1, to name them would have acknowledged their divinity. And so, for instance, in other ancient, in ancient Near Eastern creation traditions, um, the sun was a god, and the moon was a god. Um, Shamash, the sun god in uh, uh, Akkadian or uh, Babylonian uh, <coughs> uh, creation traditions, and, and the moon god, Sin. So the author refuses to name these lights and uses these sort of indirect circumlocutions to refer to them in order to make the point that the sun and the moon are not gods. They are cre creators, creatures, if you will, they are creations of God, the creator of the, of the universe. That does not say, though, according to um, Genesis 1, that these, these creations, the sun and the moon, they're not simply passive, inert agents. They are active. Because the sun has the task of ruling the day, and the moon rules the night. And so they have their own agency. In some sense, the, Genesis, the author of Genesis 1 considers them to be alive. As alive as, as sea life and aviary life populate the sky and the waters. And the land animals and human beings populate the land. And so in each of these days of 4, 5, and 6, these are the members of these domains. These populate these domains. And the fact that these domains, waters and particularly, and land, have a hand in producing this life suggests that the environment and these living creatures share an intimate bond. Uh, Genesis 1 credits the Earth for the production of life, whether it's plants or land animals. And sea creatures have their genesis within the waters, as commanded by God. And so, for instance, when you go back to verses 20 and 21, then God said that the waters produce swarms of living creatures. And then it said, and God created the sea creatures. You have together a naturalistic explanation and a theological explanation of the genesis of life. And these two verses exist quite happily together. It's like these are two different ways of saying the same thing, two different ways of accounting for the genesis of life. Same thing with the land. And God said, let the land produce land animals, creatures of the wild. And then it said, and God created the creatures of the wild. You have a more natural accounting and a more, if you will, religious, spiritual, theological accounting of the creation of life. That's not meant to be in contradiction of each other. It's meant to be together, juxtaposed together. They point to one and the same thing, the formation of life. God did it, and so did the land and the waters. And as one retired Presbyterian pastor told me, their bill is how you reconcile science and faith. It's right there in Genesis 1, because Genesis 1 covers both the naturalistic and the theological. The natural and the supernatural. <coughs> All right, well, that was sort of a sidebar. Um, but let me suggest that uh, the symmetry 
is pretty interesting, but there's another layer to this symmetry, and that is there's a day missing. What day is that? Rest. Seventh day. What happens on the seventh day? Rest. Nothing happens. Or rest, yeah. Um, and so the day of completion, that's when God formally declares everything is completed by the fact that God does nothing. God rests. Um, God uh, ushers in Sabbath or Shabbat. In fact, the Hebrew verb Shabbat literally means to cease. So this is a day of cessation, of, of no work, no creativity. Why? Because it's all been done. Uh, life has been launched. The infrastructure of the cosmos has been established. And so God now rests on the seventh day. Six days of creation, seventh day of rest. And what is unique about this last day is not only is it that no creation actually occurs, but it's also declared to be holy, sacred. And so day seven, the seventh day, is the holy day, whereas every other day is declared good. Every step of creation is declared good. And then it's the seventh day that is declared holy blessed with holiness. That is significant. This now forms a certain structure of creation that every ancient reader would be able to recognize, though it may be hard to recognize by a modern reader, which says that it's very important to really get to know the ancient context before making conclusions about how the text can be relevant today. So let me make it easy for you uh, by re kind of connecting the dots. And so, as we saw, the symmetry of between day one and day four, two and five, three and six, um, connect the dots, draw a line connecting the, um, uh, to make sure the symmetry holds. And then day seven has no corresponding partner like the previous six days. It's not there. It stands out. It's sort of the odd day. Well, it is the seventh day, so it doesn't correspond to any other day. Nothing is created. It's all about rest. But that day is holy, and that is the key to the code. That seventh day, the key to the code. So, I'm going to show you what kind of architecture Genesis 1 replicates. And it is this. It's the architecture of the temple. Or the tabernacle. And the temple or the tabernacle had three spaces. It had the outer courtyard, the central place, the nave, and then the holy, that should be holy of holies, the seventh day. That's the, that's the most holy part of the temple. And so if you walked into the temple, um, you'd first pass through the porch or the front. You'd enter into the nave, um, in which uh, there was the largest room, but only the high priest could enter into the innermost sanctum, uh, the holy of holies. Only one time a year, it was separated by a large, thick curtain. And it was that day, the special day of Yom Kippur, um, in which the high priest would enter in order to uh, perform sacrifices for the atonement of the whole community, the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Uh, and that's where God was said to reside. And there there was the Ark of the Covenant and the uh, two tablets of the Decalogue and the jar of manna Aaron's budding rod, all these holy relics restored in the Holy of Holies, uh, the inner sanctum, the, the run room that is declared the most holy. Well, that corresponds to the chronological architecture of Genesis 1. And so, tabernacle architecture, there is the outer courtyard, 
holy place and the holy of holies. And when there God was enthroned upon the wings of the seraphim, stretched out over the Ark of the Covenant. This was, in effect, God's throne room within the architecture of the tabernacle or the temple. So if we turn Genesis 1 on its side, we would get this, and it's the same pattern. Outer courtyard, nave, and holy of holies. And they're all demarcated by these different days, except for day 7, which is its own domain, the domain of holiness. So as God rested on the Sabbath, so God resides in the temple in the Holy of Holies. That's the correlation that Genesis 1 makes. And that is the same. So if we just kind of go back and forth and back and forth, and as you kind of just stare at this mesmerized, then I think you'll be convinced of my argument that uh, Genesis 1 reflects the architecture of the tabernacle. Uh, there we are. So this is the message of Genesis 1. This is the most central message of Genesis 1. It's not that creation was created in seven days. We know from science that the age of creation is older than seven days. It's older than 6,000 years. It's at least 3.81 billion years old. So, that need not be the central message of Genesis 1. Now, some have suggested that, well, a day can be metaphorical, it can be a billion years here, a billion years there. You can say that if you want, but the order of creation is different compared to the order of cosmic evolution as reconstructed by our scientists. And so, Genesis 1 is not a scientific text. Although it's interesting, you have these correlations or correspondences with the Big Bang, with the creation of light, and the fact that lights, suns, stars were created on the fourth day, separate from the creation of light on the first day, has some kind of a resonance with astrophysics, with cosmology, because the first stars weren't created till a half billion years after the Big Bang. So there's a separation between the actual creation of light and the creation of the generators of light, sun um, and the stars. And so, for whatever reason, our ancient cosmogonists, our ancient cosmologists, were able to separate the localized lights that they see in the sky with the primordial light with which God launched creation, just like the Big Bang and um, 400, years, 400 million years later, the first stars. So that's an interesting kind of correlation between science and this ancient text. On the other hand, one must recognize that, um, that according to Genesis 1, the first signs of life were plants on the land. Not so when it comes to the evolution of life on, the, on this planet. It was sea life, uh, beginning with uh, uh, monocellular life in the waters. On the other hand, there is sort of a rise of complexity, almost an evolutionary schema in Genesis 1 that begins with simplicity and concludes with complexity, which of course is best embodied by Homo sapiens, by humanity on the sixth day. So both Genesis 1 and our evolutionary biologists are in agreement that humanity, you and I, are latecomers on the scene. We're the latest form of life as we know it. And Genesis 1 affirms that as well, creation on the sixth day. But you know what the climax of creation is according to Genesis 1? It's not humanity. It's Sabbath. That's the culmination of creation according to this first account of creation of the Bible. Sabbath is the climax and culmination of creation, not humanity. Which says something about the destiny and purpose of creation. <clears throat> that in all of its activity and in the production of life 
and in the work schedule of our lives, Sabbath should be the conclusion. It should be taken seriously. So there's kind of an ethical message to Genesis 1 as well. Um, that Sabbath is the crown of creation. Do you know what the longest commandment in the Decalogue is? Sabbath. Yeah. It's the largest command in the Ten Commandments. Yeah. And it begins with, remember the Sabbath. As if to anticipate that we usually forget it. <laughs> remember the Sabbath. And the Exodus version has um, creation as the model of Sabbath keeping. Saying God created the six days and rested on the seventh day, and so you should do the same. You should model your life after the life of God when it comes to creation. In Deuteronomy, which is a different version, Deuteronomy find a different version of the Sabbath commandment, of the Decalogue as a whole. The reason given for observing the Sabbath is not that God rested on the seventh day, but that you were once slaves in Egypt, and you did not know what Sabbath was. So Sabbath, for Deuteronomy, is an act of liberation, rest, is a liberation from work. It is a, an exercise of freedom, the Sabbath. So, same command, two different reasons for observing the Sabbath. Um, creationally and for liberation. So Sabbath is really a very central command in the Decalogue, and it is the climax of creation in Genesis 1. But I think the message of Genesis 1 is that creation is God's cosmic sanctuary. That is the thesis of Genesis 1. It is structured as if it were a temple. From days 1 to 7, you line them up in their symmetrical arrangement and you get the pattern of the temple, the architecture of the temple. That is the message, that all of creation is God's cosmic temple or cosmic sanctuary. God is the temple builder. The first temple in the Bible was not Solomon's temple. It's creation. And the image of God we are the image of God. In any other temple in the ancient Near East outside of Jerusalem, every temple had its statue there in the Holy of Holies. Marduk, Ishtar, Baal, Asherah. It was a statue or some kind of image, concrete image made out of wood, gold, precious metal, they're standing in the temple. What Genesis does is says, we are that image. We are that image. Living, breathing, walking, talking images of God. We are walking, breathing, moving, talking theophanies. It's a very elevated view of humanity, I must say. That we are to reflect God's presence in the world. And what is God's way in the world? Well, Genesis 1, God likes to create collaboratively, in community. And so that should be our model, including six days of work, seventh day of rest. God's cosmic sanctuary. Genesis 1, however, never asks the question, or maybe never answers the question, will God ever enter into God's own sanctuary? Will God ever enter, in, enter into God's own creation? That's left open in Genesis. And it's left open throughout the book of Genesis. It really doesn't get answered until you get to the Gospel of John. In the prologue of John, 
we read the words, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. According to John, God does formally enter into creation in the form of Christ. In Christ, God has entered into God's own sanctuary, into creation. We may talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, but in any case, with this sort of thesis in mind that Genesis 1 claims creation to be God's cosmic temple, what kind of God is this? Well, I want to kind of enter into this, because I've talked enough, I want to enter into this with sort of a musical visual meditation of what that might look like. And so what I've done is I've collected some images of creation and I've put them to music. And I thought, well, what kind of music would be appropriate to kind of narrate through images uh, the story of Genesis 1? And I thought, well, we don't worship in temples ourselves as Christians. We do worship in churches. And if you kind of envision creation as a great cathedral, what kind of music would be appropriate to that? Well, I can only think of Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs>
I want to end with these words. Uh, this phrase was coined back in the late 60s or so. We are as gods, and we might as well get good at it. Do uh, you know where that came from? Stuart Brandt, the editor of the Whole Earth Catalog in 1968. Um, there's something that resonates with uh, Genesis 1 in this expression. Although our ancient author would not say we are as gods, um, the author would say simply we are God's images. We are God's images, and we might as well good, get good at it. Uh, now, Stuart Brent has revised that more recently, and this is what he says. We are as gods, and we have to get good at it. Or as the ancient author would remind us, we are God's images, and we have to get good at it. How do we get good at that? Well, that's something for us perhaps to explore this weekend. Um, but um, nowhere do we find in Genesis 1 God exploiting the earth, or God conquering the earth, God destroying this or that. This God is a life-giving, sustaining God who revels and delights in creating life through these agents of earth and waters. So to be good at being God's images of the world, uh, we have to respect the life that God has created in the world. Uh, ourselves, our humanity, land animals, fish of the sea, great sea monsters, birds of the air, plants and the like, all to be shared, not to be hoarded and, uh, and exploited. So, I would simply add to that, we are as servants, and we have to get good at that too. Yeah. Um, if we move into the next creation story in Genesis 2, Adam is created out of the dust of the ground. And what is his commission? To serve and to preserve, or to till and to keep the garden. Better, better translated, to serve and to preserve it. And so that also has to be coupled with the command to be fruitful and multiply and exercise dominion over creation. It is a servant's kind of dominion that we are called to do. So I hope this little exercise um, uh, helped you get kind of get into the spirit of Genesis 1, the first creation account of the Bible. We brought in a little bit of science to show us how it resonates with science and cosmology, but what also differs from it. But within that conversation, to know that the message of Genesis 1 is not a scientific message. It is an ethical, moral message that is intensely theological, and it is this. To be good at being God's images, we have to recognize that creation itself is God's cosmic sanctuary, God's cosmic temple. And so we have to respect the sacredness of God's creation as God's cosmic temple. We have no reason to efface it or to destroy it. Um, what would you feel if, when you came to Newport Presbyterian Church Sunday morning and you saw graffiti sprayed all over the sanctuary? It'd make you upset, make you mad. Well, are we doing that to God's cosmic sanctuary? Something to ponder. In any case, we begin a journey. And we begin it in the beginning, in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God. And now, tomorrow, we'll move to another text of wonder in which wound and pain and suffering lead to a sense of wonder. And that's the testimony of the book of Job. And so we'll explore that tomorrow morning. So I hope you'll come back. It's been fun, and I'm going to hang around for any questions and comments you might have. I think the show was supposed to last till 9 o'clock, so it's 5 till 9. Um, so, any questions or comments at this point? Well, thank you. I'll be around for individual comments. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I am delighted.
delighted to welcome us back. And for those who weren't here maybe last night, welcome you for the first time. You're in for a treat. We just had a wonderful time last night with Dr. Brown uh, sharing with us, and we look forward to a, a great day today. Linda will introduce him a little bit more, uh, but I just wanted to give a, a shout out, a welcome to all of you for making this and uh, to open us with prayer. So please join me. Holy loving God, we do thank you so much that we are given this gift, this opportunity uh, to sit and learn, uh, to listen, and we just pray that you will help us to, to just sense the nudge of your Holy Spirit in our own lives. Speak to us today, surprise us, draw us in even deeper uh, into your mystery and the incredible love uh, that you have for us and all of creation. So we, we give you thanks and praise uh, for the opportunity to be in community today. And so we pray this all for your blessings and for your glory. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, first, thank you, everybody, for coming. And again, I want to recognize Dave, for whom we wouldn't have the Meekoff lectures otherwise. So thank you very much for this 20-year tradition. Um, reflecting on last night, um, so I have two thoughts. One, I'm um, even more impressed with all the cool people that Dr. Brown gets to hang out with. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about um, all the brilliant people that have influenced your work. Um, and then secondly, I realized how I have personally really taken the Genesis story for granted. And it's a story that we hear, you know, literally from, you know, three years old on, and I had never stopped to reflect that, oh, it really doesn't say that God created everything, that this was a collaborative effort. Um, so that was a conversation um, this morning. So huge welcome again to Dr. Brown, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. So oh, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Linda, for those reflections. I did my dissertation on Genesis 1 back in the day. It was sort of a technical thing, as dissertations go. It was a text-critical analysis of the Hebrew text uh, in comparison to the Septuagint, or the Greek translation. And uh, I argued something rather radical in the day, that the Greek translation preserves, preserved an older version of Genesis 1 than the Masoretic tradition that we find in the Jewish Bible today. Uh, but I always say that because, Linda, your comments reminded me of the fact that after I graduated from Emory University with my freshly minted PhD and started teaching at Union, at the time Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, um, it took me about two or three years to um, actually get my mind beyond the first chapter of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> I love Genesis. <laughs> And I'm always discovering new things about Genesis 1. So you're right, Linda. It's so easy to take these familiar texts for granted, but there's always some surprise waiting uh, if you dig deeply enough. So, yeah, for those of you who showed up last night and endured Genesis 1, thank you for coming back. It was totally your choice, and you must be a glutton for punishment, because here we go uh, into two other creation texts that I find particularly fascinating. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to share uh, sort of the hermeneutic or the way I read biblical texts, and I call it the hermeneutic of awe or hermeneutic of wonder, which is sort of a posture of expectancy to be surprised, to expect something new uh, to come forth as one reads and studies a particular biblical text, even a very familiar text. And so uh, this thing called wonder is something that I've wondered about for a few years. Um, and I've been sort of astounded how this term is used in a very broad sense, so broad that this Venn diagram that you see, uh, you can find it on Google Images very easily, it's kind of iconic now, but you see the common ground of wonder that uh, it lies at the overlap between science on the one hand and art on the other. Uh, can you see the overlap that says wonder? Yes. Okay, 
So science, and uh, in fact, I wanted to ask Nathan or Jacob if they understood these uh, equations here on the left, if they look familiar at all. Um, one mathematician said he thought he knew what that was about, but um, I, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, and then art, this sort of abstract art on the right. And then the intersection there, wonder, is actually um, a portion of the um, of a deep of a photo from uh, a deep space photo from the Hubble telescope, uh, which uh, is part of what's called the seven called the pillars of creation. Uh, so it's kind of artistic, but it's also, of course, astronomical. So a fitting <laughs> fitting way to depict the overlap. Uh, so have you ever thought of wonder being sort of the uh, driving force behind scientific progress? Of what happened? Yeah. In fact. Um, uh, I've heard scientists say that wonder is the thing that drives the best of science. Always wondering, questioning, searching, um, filled with a sense of mystery, with the awareness that the world will always be more than we ever know about the world. And then art, yeah, uh, it's not a form of investigation, it's a form of expression, uh, poetry, music, uh, uh, the auditory and the visual, um, uh, motivated by wonder in many cases. And so, yeah, maybe it is uh, reasonable to think that wonder is something shared by both science and art, even though they're so different from each other. But I'd like to suggest that there is a missing circle here. And I would call it uh, faith, or perhaps more specifically, theology. And if theology is, according to St. Anselm, faith that seeks understanding, or faith seeking understanding, and if science is a form of human understanding seeking further understanding, then theology, and, or faith, has nothing to fear from science, but all to gain from science. And as we talked about last night, if God is the author of creation, as well as the author of the Bible, of the Word, that is, God is both the author of the Word and the world, then it's only natural, it's good and right to read these two books together in conversation. And so that's part of what we're going to be doing this morning, as we did last night. So I want to introduce uh, uh, a certain shade of wonder in the Bible. I'm uh, talking about wisdom's wonder, specifically in the book of Proverbs. And I want to identify a creation text within Proverbs, specifically chapter 8, verses 22 to 31, that is filled with wonder uh, about the world, but in a very distinctive way. Um, before we do that, by way of introduction, I want to show another interesting passage from Proverbs in chapter 3 that reads like this, The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth by understanding. God established the heavens by God's knowledge. The deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. Another way to put this is that in God's wisdom, creation and wisdom intermingle. That is, the fabric of, within the fabric of creation, wisdom is interwoven. Wisdom, God's wisdom, is revealed in creation. It's there to be seen, to be detected, um, to be investigated. It is open. There's nothing hidden about God's wisdom as reflected in creation. But somehow, creation can be revelatory of God's wisdom. Uh, that's kind of the message here in Proverbs. A um, kind of an interesting reflection on this, a very contemporary reflection by a well-known scientist, uh, uh, is this. The most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible. <laughs> Do you know who said that? <laughs> Did he ring a bell? Oh. Yeah. That is to say that the world, there is no reason for the world to have been made in a way that is comprehensible by the human intellect. It could be it could have been all chaos, total mystery. Uh, and yet, no, the world in which we live actually corresponds to mathematics, uh, to certain scientific theories, the law of gravity that can be measured mathematically. 
In fact, if you think about it, it's kind of a wonder, if not a mystery, that mathematics works at all. That the numbers that we generate and the equations that we generate in our minds actually correspond to the reality in which we live. Uh, so there's something about what one philosopher called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. It's kind of a mystery that it works at all. And it does. And that's amazing. That itself is a mystery. You know, the most incomprehensible thing about the world, about reality, is that it is comprehensible. That's not to say that everything is comprehensible, that mystery is ruled out. No, there's also an awareness, again, that um, the world will always be more than we ever know about the world. Um, and right now, there's still a great mystery surrounding these, uh, these things called dark matter and dark energy. We still don't know what they are. We know kind of what they do. Dark matter holds the galaxies in place even as the galaxies expand, uh, separate each other at an accelerating rate due to dark energy. And I think uh, within the next few years, we'll have more to say about dark matter and dark energy. But right now, they still remain mysteries. And they also constitute the vast majority of the makeup of reality. That is to say, what we can see and touch and feel makes up only 4% of the universe. So, with that in mind, let's move to one of my favorite texts of the Bible, a wonder text, what I call a text of tremendum. Proverbs 22 verses to 26 and then beyond that to verse 31. So this is the first half of, the, uh, of that passage in this slide. So let me just read it to you, but I want you to ponder as you hear this text, who is speaking and how is creation depicted? And what is your image of God? So your image of the speaker, your image of God, and your image of creation as described in this passage. The Lord created me as the beginning of creation, the first of God's acts of long ago. A bowl that was woven at the very beginning, even before the earth itself. When there were no depths, I was given birth. When there were no springs abounding with water, when the mountains were not yet anchored before the hills themselves, I was birthed. When the Lord had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil, when God established the heavens, I was there. When God drew a circle on the face of the deep, when God secured the skies above, when God established the fountains of the deep, when God assigned the limit so that the waters might not transgress God's command, when God marked out the foundations of the earth, I was beside God growing up. I was God's delight day by day, playing before God at every moment, playing in God's inhabited world and delighting in the offspring of Adam. Who's speaking? Wisdom. Wisdom. <laughs> Who is wisdom? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> wisdom in Proverbs is personified as feminine. And she's featured at the very beginning of Proverbs. She takes her stand in the city gates and tells everyone that they're going to hell. That's pretty much the summary of her statement. That as those who reject her are going to suffer catastrophe. And so she speaks prophetically, kind of as a prophet of gloom and doom in Proverbs 1. But then when you get to Proverbs 8, She's much more, you might say, open-hearted. She's welcoming anyone who would come to listen to her. And she talks about how she is, um, she is the voice of God, and she is the one who shows the path of righteousness and justice. She'll show you the path of life. She'll help you become prosperous uh, and of good character. Uh, she's all about the formation of good and just character. Uh, she urges us all to follow her ways. But then when you get to this final portion of Proverbs 8, 
she talks about herself in relationship to creation and into, in, in relationship to God as well. So how do you see her in this particular passage? How does she present herself? How would you describe her as she bears witness to God creating the world? Yeah, particularly at this end, she sees herself as a child. In fact, we go back, she talks of herself being birthed. In fact, this, uh, this language, of old I was woven at the very beginning, woven, that is actually a metaphor for gestation in the womb. And it's the same language you find in Psalm 139, I was knit together in my mother's womb. It's the same imagery. And so here she's talking about her gestation in the womb and then, and then being birthed. So I have to ask, whose womb are we talking about? I think there's only one possibility. God's womb. And so child wisdom, woman wisdom, um, highlights something of the maternal dimension of God. God is mother here to wisdom. And yet, more than mother, how is God described from her eyes as she witnesses God working, constructing creation? How would you describe God in the construction of creation? How would you describe work, God's work in creation? What is God doing? Creating. Creating. What else? More specifically. Breathing. Pardon? Breathing. Breathing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Breathing hard. <laughs> right. Yeah. Working a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. There's a lot of verbs. Right. He's defining. God's acting. Defining. I'm sorry, Ann. What did you say? There's a lot of verbs. A lot of verbs. Yeah. Action. Action verbs, yeah. And how would you, even more specifically, how would you describe these actions? Designing. Designing, okay. Constructing, establishing, securing, measuring. All those things, what do you usually associate them? Engineering. Engineering or architecture. Yeah, yeah. So, so God is kind of a construction worker here uh, who plans it out carefully, methodically, and then does the uh, does the act of constructing? God is a constructor. Oh, labor. Okay, yeah, laborer. Yeah, so a construction worker, uh, as well as the architect behind the construction as well. And uh, uh, for better or worse, um, you know, you may want to associate that with uh, uh, as something masculine. I don't know. Not necessarily so, to be sure. Uh, but perhaps the point here is that God embraces both uh, the feminine and the masculine, uh, the maternal and the paternal, uh, in, this, in this wonderfully evocative passage. So but let me pose this question, which I think is the most important. What is creation for? Okay, yeah. Let me make it more specific. What is creation for wisdom? Playground. A playground. What does what does wisdom do at the end? Playing in God's inhabited world, delighting in the offspring of Adam. So the, the passage concludes with wisdom's joy and play playing with God, playing before God every moment, but also playing in the world that God has constructed. And this kind of construction is uh, secure, well-established. It has its limits or boundaries so that chaos doesn't overwhelm it. It has strong foundations. All the time, wisdom is growing up beside God and ends up playing in God's world. So actually, I think you're right. Creation is wisdom's playground. It is a child, 
Should we say the child-proof playground? <laughs> it's a child-friendly playground where she can play and delight him. You know. um, and uh, notice that it's not said that all of creation is for the offspring of Adam. Uh, fortunately, uh, we're mentioned here at the end, but as play partners to wisdom in God's inhabited world. So yeah, the world is inhabited, it is living, it is vibrant, it's also secure and well-established, but it's all for wisdom's play. It is for wisdom's play. And in play, she grows up. Now I have to confess something. This is the NBV version, the New Brown version. It's my translation. It's different from what you find in the NRSV. And there's a big debate on this one. It's a Hebrew, one Hebrew word, and how this is translated. Uh, sometimes translated as master craftsman. Very different from uh, a word that pertains to a child growing up, but it's, a, it's kind of a mystery word in Hebrew, amon. Uh, so my, my argument is simply that, given the context of this final verse, where wisdom is clearly a child playing before God and playing in the world, that this is the most appropriate translation uh, for this word about wisdom's relationship to God and to creation. But it could be a double entendre as well. Maybe wisdom has a hand in the actual creating of creation with God. But I don't see that here in Proverbs 8 as much. So in any case, at least one aspect of wisdom is clear. She is a child, and she is overflowing with a sense of wonder and delight and playfulness in the world. And the irony of ironies with this passage is that wisdom admits that she needs to grow in wisdom. As a child is to grow and mature and develop in wisdom. And part of that development is to play, to play with others, to explore. For a child, everything is new. Hence, everything is wondrous to be explored. A child's curiosity, we refer to. A child's sense of wonder, um, that's a given. The question is, as we grow up and become responsible adults, have we lost that sense of childlike wonder? And I think part of wisdom's message is that you should never lose that. It's part of wisdom. It's an integral part of wisdom. To kind of tap into that, I want to do a little exercise. And so this is going to be our morning energizer. So if you can, if you're able, please stand up. And what I want you to do is repeat everything I say in the way that I say it. It, and it's not, uh, what's the sign says, there's no gotcha to this game. It's not a game, it's just an exercise. But this is something that can easily be done with children, uh, particularly children who uh, can't read quite yet, but they love to repeat things. That's why you have to be careful around children, uh, because they repeat exactly what you say. But you're going to repeat exactly what I say. What I'm going to say is kind of a summary of what we've just read in Proverbs 8, except perhaps you might say boiled down in simpler language. All right, here we go. Yeah. In the beginning, God created me. In the beginning, God created me. God created me. God created me. 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 I was woven from the very beginning. I was woven from the very beginning. Woven in the womb. Before the Big Bang, I was birthed. Before the Big Bang, I was birthed. Before Earth and all stars. Before Earth and all stars. Before the hills were anchored in place. Before the hills were anchored in place. I was given birth. I was given birth. Before the moon kindled the darkness. Before the moon kindled the darkness. Before the wind kindled the fire. Before the wind kindled the fire. Before the rain filled every ocean. 